I'm Brian Phipps. I'm one of the pastors here at Westside. And how about kind of joining me in thanking our creative arts team? Is that cool? I wish I had that kind of creativity. I don't. I never will. But man, they are good and I'm so grateful. It's summertime. Summertime means vacation for a lot of people. Vacation for the Phipps family means driving 19 hours to Central Florida to visit family, and then there's 19 hours back, and it's a long way. I don't like to spend time in the car. It reminds me of a time in the car from my childhood that I would just assume not remember anymore. We were going on a, to a lake in West Virginia. My mom and dad had a beautiful Mercury Zephyr with the blue vinyl seats you know, a track player rocking the tunes along the way. Dad said, we're going to a lake. There's great fishing there. I could not sleep the night before. Anxious, ready to be there. Had no idea how long it would take. So we get in the car, and we didn't have iPads and iTouches and iPhones and all this. We had to play these games where you actually had to interact with other people in the vehicle. I mean, if you remember the alphabet game, the license plate game, I mean, you had to talk. It was horrible that you had to interact with other people in your family. But we did that, 20 bottles of milk on the wall, all those things like that. And so we're going, and I'm waiting as long as I can before I ask the question that every kid asks, how much longer? And my dad says, 20 more minutes. <laughs> yeah, you know where this is going, don't you? So I'm thinking, okay, cool, 20 more minutes. So it's another round of the games and all this. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And uh, I finally just can't help it anymore. Dad, how much longer? 20 more minutes. I said, what is going on here? I mean, maybe he took a wrong turn or whatever. We're giving him the benefit of the doubt. So we go as long as I can to ask before I ask you. And I said, Dad, just <laughs> how much longer? By this point, he is looking at my mom snickering because he knows he's trying to make me miserable. And he said, 20 more minutes. And I, was, I just ruined the rest of the trip for everybody. I was so mad, sulked in the back seat, was just miserable and just made the most horrible thing about it. We are wrapping up this series called Messy Church that we've been through all summer long. Basically working through the last half of the book of Acts, following the life of the Apostle Paul, who was the guy that wrote most of the New Testament and the guy that took the mission of Jesus out from Israel to the Mediterranean world or the Western world as we know it. And as we've gone through that, we have seen that life is dirty, it's emotional, it's wild, it's weird, it's long. As Troy and Jason the last two weeks taught us, it's difficult and it's painful. And at some point, Paul and we who are going through messes raise our hand and say, Daddy, how long? And what do we hear? 20 more minutes. If you've been there, you know what it's like to ask that question. How much longer can I, you know, do I have to persevere through this? God, I get the fact that you want to do something in me and through me and beyond me, but really? This? This long? When's it going to let up? Now, all the way through this series, I keep asking myself the question, how in the world did Paul do this? How did he keep going? How did he not stop? How did he not get to the point where he said, God, if this is all you have for me, then I'm done with you. Because it's easy for us to do that as people who are following him. If things don't go the way we want, we could tend to cash out. Well, Paul kind of knew in his heart the big idea that we have been working with this whole series. Write this in the blank, if you will. The world is a messy place. His expectations were realistic. He said, the world is a messy place. I can't expect it to be any different. But he also knew this. God uses our messes to help us become more like Jesus. He got that. He got that. But how do you get it? And how did he stay with that? I mean, even if you're willing, I mean, let's just be honest. Even if you're willing to submit to that thought and you're walking through that mess, at some point you got to say, Dad, <laughs> How much longer? 
And when you hear 20 more minutes over and over, it's easy to sit just to kind of drop back in your own little blue vinyl seated mercury zephyr of life and just steam, right? So how did Paul do it? Well, personally, Paul, I've been a fan of Paul all my life. You know, favorite guy in the whole book called the Bible. And you might say, well, Jesus is the best guy. And I get that, but he's God. And Paul's not, and I'm not. And so Paul is the guy who's trying to figure out how do I walk with Jesus on this earth when it is such a messy place? And how do I keep letting the messes be something that I endure and persevere through instead of giving up? Paul gets it. I want to understand Paul. So I've studied him my whole life. I love him. I love spending time with him. And I understand that this guy made it through in spite of all this stuff. And what was he about? Before we go to and get that answer, because I think that there is a good answer that we can find from kind of uh, his life and several of the things that he wrote, I want to go to the last chapter of the book of Acts. We're wrapping up the book of Acts today as well as Messy Church, the series, and we're going to go to Acts 28. We're going to start in verse 11, and the reason we want to just read through most of this passage is to see Paul in action until the story is over, because we can only really know our guy if we see him in his final hour. And here he is. What a blast. Starting in verse 11, we're going to skip through it. If you're following in your Bible, we're going to skip through some verses, but all the verses will be up here on the screen. It says, when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So here's Paul. He's finally in Rome. He's been waiting to get to Rome to make his appeal to Caesar there. And uh, the shipwrecks are over. The snake bite's over. He is there. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. Interestingly enough, he didn't say, I need to take a two-week vacation after all that. I mean, he gets into his flat with his soldier under house arrest, and three days later, he's pulling in the leaders of the Jews. Now, real quick commentary on that. The Jews were not his fans. The Jews were a part of his big mess all along. They were trying to imprison him. They were trying to uh, persecute him. And uh, so these, these guys were not his fans. They were guys that he was trying to share the gospel of Jesus with. So three days later, he calls together the leaders of the Jews. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day, and they came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. And then from morning until evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So he invites them to his flat. Now, don't think... New York City, Manhattan flat. Think on the other side of the, of the tracks flat. I mean, he's in an apartment. All these guys come, and he spends from morning till evening using the Hebrew Bible to try to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. This is our boy. This is his mission. This is what he does. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Now, you might think, end the day, end the story, next day, but not Paul. Listen to how boldly and confidently he just goes for it. They disagreed amongst themselves, and they finally began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Do you hear what he's doing here? He's looking at these people saying, you're rejecting this, and Isaiah said that this would happen a long time ago. You're those people. Now, to put that into perspective for you, imagine one of us getting up here one day going, yeah, you got your pretty little dress on, you got your hair all made up, and you got your makeup on, but here's the deal. You aren't paying attention to me. You don't see me. This is speaking for Jesus here, and you're blind, and you'll never get it. And it's your fault. Shape up. Paul's coming right at these people, making every last attempt to share the gospel of Jesus with them because they're rejecting that. And Paul wanted them to have this beautiful life. And he goes on down to the, a few verses later. He says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's our guy. 
That's how the book of Acts ends. Doesn't tell us how his life ends. Doesn't tell him about the rest. Just says for two more years, Paul kept business as usual and never, ever stopped. How did he do it? Well, in studying Paul's life, I believe Paul kind of had an operating system that guided all of his, his activity. I mean, your phone, your computer, all of it has an operating system, and every app has to work with that. And for Paul, life experiences were kind of the app that came through, and his operating system, some truths that tr truly shaped him, caused everything that he went through, every mess, every problem, every win, every loss, to go through this filter. And what I want to do is kind of break this operating system of his down into a couple of words. And the first one we're going to look at is motive, because I think that there were some, some truths or some ideas that really fueled Paul, that were his motives, his primary objectives in life, if you will. And secondly, there was a manner or a way that he approached life. And when I talk about manner, I'm not talking about, you know, be a little good little boy or girl and don't burp at the dinner table manners. I'm talking about a manner in which he conducted himself. There was a set of truths that shaped how he lived and how he approached life. And here's the beautiful thing. We don't, let, we don't have to let Paul hold on to those to himself. We can adopt that operating system. We can adopt those motives that fueled him. We can adopt that manner that shaped him. And I believe, I believe very strongly that if you truly do adopt those mindsets in your own system, that whatever the mess, whatever the situation, you will persevere to the very end, business as usual, and it be a beautiful thing. Write this in the blank, if you will. We can adopt Paul's motives. We can adopt Paul's motives. We can adopt the truths that fueled him. And one of the motives for Paul was this. My mess will soon be done. This is all going to be over one day. And I know that it's going to soon be done. In fact, if you kind of read through all of Paul's stuff, Paul kind of considers his life, his mess down here on earth, to be this teeny little dot. And then from the time he gets to heaven, through infinity, eternity with Jesus is all this infinite line that just keeps going on and on and on and on forever. And his, his whole MO is how I live in this little dot is going to determine how I experience this infinite line forever. So why would I concern myself with this little dot? Why would I be concerned about this mess when all of that is to be lived for? Look what Paul has to say. He says it so well in 2 Timothy 4. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I'm at the end of the dot. I'm at the end of the mess. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Now check this out. That verse was most likely written right there in the flat that we just read about. He's like, man, I'm getting close to the end. And I don't know if you know the end. Tradition holds that Paul's end was a beheading in a public square. I mean, picture the nasty ISIS videos that came out where they take the guys out on the beach, put, cut their heads off, and put it on YouTube fashion to be able to make a statement. Paul was taken out there and beheaded according to Tradition. He probably knew that's how it's going to end, but the whole way he's saying, dude, this is just a dot. This mess will one day be done. But there's also something else he knew, another motive that kept him going. Write this one in the blanks as well. Jesus' mission will one day be done. Jesus came in to restore everything that was broken. Jesus came to bring reconciliation for the people of God back to the God of God. And he came back to bring peace and restoration to get this whole creation back into the original uh, creation you know, specs. That was his whole mission. And Paul knew that Jesus had said something powerful in his day. Jesus said the gospel will be shared all across the world to the ends of the earth. And then curtain call and it's done. Essentially, that's the Phipps modern messed up translation right there for you. But that's what Jesus said. Paul puts it in these terms, and I love it. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Paul knew that Jesus would accomplish his mission. And he also knew that at the end, when that curtain call does come, everyone will acknowledge that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Some people will enjoy and acknowledge that from a place of beauty and fellowship with God. Others under the earth will acknowledge that far, far from God and not in a helpful way. And Paul's saying, Man, my thought is so teeny, but I want everybody to know Jesus from the good God who loves and wants to restore and bring peace and hope and salvation and redemption to those people. These things fueled him, fueled Paul, and nothing else mattered. So let me just kind of break things down a little bit with that whole motivation thing. There, there's something that motivates all of us. We all have those things that motivate us, whatever it is. And at one point, Jesus talks about this. He's talking about money, and he says, you can't serve both God and money, right? Well, bottom line, money is the currency in this place, in this world, which is a mess, right? Money's a mess. Everything else is a mess. And when Jesus talks about money, he says you can't serve two masters. You can either invest in the place where moth and, where moth and rust don't destroy the life after, the line, or you can be worried about the money down here where everything's going to fade and go away. And Paul wouldn't understand a person who said, I want to make sure everything down here works. Paul's mind was so far outside of the dot that that's how he lived in the dot. That was his priority. Anytime, friends, anytime we prioritize the life down here and the situation down here, the mess remains the master instead of the good master who leads to life. Does that make sense? And that's a gut check for every one of us because we all prioritize, even to the point where we don't see. Our eyes are blind, our ears can't hear, and we don't want to hear almost how to prioritize something beyond this life because in reality, there's parts of us that don't want to trust that that's even there. Am I talking the right stuff here? Does that make sense? But until we change that priority, until we adopt that part of Paul's operating system, the mess is going to mess with us instead of the master ruling us. Let's go on to the second thing here. We, can't, we don't just have the privilege of adopting Paul's motives. We also have the privilege of adopting Paul's manner, some truths that shaped him. Another book that Paul wrote most likely from Rome is the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6. He says this. It says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Two things I want you to, to circle here, if you would. The, he began a good work. He began a good work, if you wouldn't mind circling that phrase. And then carry it on to completion. Began a good work, carry it on to completion. I believe those two ideas wrapped up in this one verse shaped how Paul viewed his life and viewed his ministry in the world that would flow out of that. This is the manner in which he walked. The first thing that he would say, just trying to put words into Paul's mouth, was, I didn't begin this work. He began a good work in you. Jesus began a good work. Paul would say, I did not begin the good work in my life. I can't take credit for it. I didn't deserve it. I was going a very different direction. Now, a lot of us have come to Christ in very, very different ways. If you're here, you've intersected with Jesus in one way or another. A lot of us who are, who are walking and growing with Christ did a bunch of stupid stuff early. Any takers on that one, right? And continue to do stupid. I've got a master's degree in stupidity, right? And so a lot of us started with there, and Jesus said, I, I love you, and I accept you just the way you are, and I'm going to make you into something beautiful and new, and we keep moving. For Paul, it was a very different experience. Paul thought he was on track with God better than anyone else, and no one was going to stop him. In fact, in Philippians, continuing on with this book, I want you to hear what Paul had to say about himself and his own pedigree. He says this, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And when he says in the flesh, he says in my own ability to please God. 
And then he gives us a little resume. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. We can unpack every one of these things he says, but essentially he's saying, look at my pedigree. Look at my stock. I'm a thoroughbred. I'm from the, I'm the, from the best of the cut of cloth of God's people. Nobody's better. Benjamin, crown jewel of Israel, right? I come from the right people. And then he says, in regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. And he took that to be a good thing. We're in the Christian church. We're used to 2,000 years of the teaching of Scripture, and the Pharisees are always considered to be the bad guys. But in reality, Paul was a leading Pharisee, and they were the people that kept the rules more than anybody else. Unfortunately, they're like a lot of Christians today who have become the moral police for everyone else because they've kept the rules so well. But great intentions. I mean, they're thinking they're pleasing God. As far as I'm legalistic stuff, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. Got to go to a Royals game this last Thursday or this last Monday. We we're playing the Pittsburgh Pirates, and you see the, the people there that have painted their chests and put on the wigs and all that and all that heat. And I'm going, that's a lot of zeal for a baseball team. I get it. They're rock stars. They're killing it. They're doing a great job. That's zeal. Paul says, You think that's zeal? I was killing people because I thought they were wrong with God. I mean, it's. For a person who thinks he's going the right way with God, he was on the path. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. How many of you can put your hand up and say, hey, you know, when it comes to following Jesus, I just don't think I've sinned in the last forever. So what he's saying? That's a pedigree. That's a resume. And then look what he says. But... Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Isaac Newton, one of his laws of motion said, an object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an outside force. Paul would say, I was an object in motion and I was going to stay in motion until it killed me and then Jesus <laughs> kaboomed me out of nowhere and changed it all, put me on a very, very different direction. Jesus began this work. Paul knew it. Look at the verse. I know that you've already flipped over, so read it with me there. We, have, we love because he first loved us. I guess you didn't flip it yet, did you? Try with me again one more time. We love because he first loved us loved us. You get that? Paul is saying there, he began the good work. My life is his. It's not mine. I don't have any sense of entitlement to the rights and privileges that come because of him, because he started that work, not me. He knew that Jesus started it, but he also knew that Jesus would finish his work. He knew that he would finish his work. Romans 5, 3 through 5 are verses that have meant the, the absolute world to me. These are my life verses for a number of years. Paul writes these words. We also rejoice in our sufferings. You might want to write mess right above that word sufferings. We, we also rejoice in our mess because we know that the mess or suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, I want to pause there for a second and just walk through that. Because this whole idea that Jesus uses our messes to make us more like Jesus doesn't make sense until you get this. And I promise you, if you get this, it will change your life significantly, and you'll never view a mess the same way. When we, when we rejoice in our sufferings and, and, we, and we don't quit and we obey Jesus and we listen to him and we do what's next and we don't stop, it says that the suffering or the mess produces perseverance. It gives us strength. It, it fortifies those spiritual muscles that, that have yet to develop. We develop perseverance. And as we develop perseverance, perseverance over time produces what? You see it there? Character. 
making me more like Jesus the farther I go. All of a sudden, it's almost like I'm a piece of wood that's just raw, and then the master starts to use his knife and whittle it away and start to make something beautiful out of it. The suffering is what he uses to whittle that something beautiful, and as I'm persevering, I'm actually being formed into something new. And character does what? It gives us hope. What does that mean? Well, the, the reason the character produces hope is that next time I hit another mess, I can know that as I continue to develop more perseverance, I'll also continue to produce what? More character. And I know that because I'm being changed on the inside out by Jesus, that God's not going to waste a single mess. And the hope will not disappoint us. Why? Because it's poured out to us out of his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Paul could, Paul could say that Jesus is going to complete this work not because it's just a pie-in-the-sky idea that's propaganda to try to fuel you on with inspiration that's empty. Paul is able to say Jesus will complete the work because Jesus has been doing the work incrementally all the way through my life until now, and he is not going to stop what he's already done. Does that make sense? Absolutely life-changing for me. Now, I realize that it's impossible to trust this until you've actually been through it. And everybody in this room is going to come to the point one day where you're in the mess and you're deciding whether or not you're going to rest in the mess. And there's options. You can try to go around the mess. You can try to deny the mess. You can medicate through the mess. You can do all this stuff in the mess that you want. But Jesus is saying, just rest in me in the mess and trust me and I will carry you through however long it is, whether you hear God say in 20 more minutes or we're there. For me, that night was a pretty special night. I uh, singer-songwriter earlier on in my, in my day. I wanted to be a famous Christian musician. I quit school to do it thinking I was being a righteous kid making great sacrifices, like not going to college anymore was a great sacrifice and for a young guy. But I got really depressed. I was living in Tallahassee, Florida at the time and um, slogging around uh, grout and concrete and ceramic tile, working at uh, color tile back in the day, just trying to make a living until I could somehow be famous and Striper would open up for me one day. That was the dream that I had, you know, didn't set a bar too low. But I was really depressed because that just wasn't working out. And I'm going, God, how much longer? And it was the 20 more minutes. And I was just frustrated. So I had a key to a church there in town in Tallahassee that they let me go and just play the piano in the sanctuary. And that's where my soul would kind of get okay and I'd keep going. And that night I went to play and I was trying to connect with God and have a sense of being okay. And it just didn't come. I mean, there was no, there, there wasn't even a 20 more minutes, just just silence. And I got angry and I just kind of pounded down on the keys and started to walk out. And I ended up walking out and sitting on one of the pews. Uh, the pews is a bench in the church that we used to have growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know what that was. And I just sat there and I cried 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 and I cried. And I thought, you know, God, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a breaking point here. And I remember the verse where Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to be dislodged and thrown into the sea. And I thought, well, you know, if he can move a mountain like that, certainly he can move one of these little red hymn books. So I grabbed one, and I threw it on the floor, and I just stared at it. <laughs> and I just mustered up the biggest prayer I could. I'm quoting the scripture and saying, God, I mean, if you're really real, I mean, it's not a mountain. That's just a hymn book. Just, just. Just move it a little, you know, anything. And the book didn't move. So I take it and I slam it back into the back of the pew there, and I'm making my way out of the room. And to get out of the room the way I came in, you have to, you have to go up, turn off the lights. You had to go walk across the pulpit. And if you're familiar with kind of a traditional church, you got the pulpit that the preacher preaches from, and you've got the lectern over here that had the church Bible on it, great big Bible, big print and whatnot, so I'm walking out. I've got to turn off the last light on the way out. And the last light is actually a light that pointed to the lectern. And as I was going and I was mad, I was storming my way out. It's almost as if God grabbed my face and my chin and put me focused down onto that book. And my eyes went right to a verse. And it was, 
we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. It's Romans 5, 3 through 5. And I wept. The hymn book didn't move, but boy, my heart moved right there because God reached in and he said, I haven't forgotten you. In fact, if you'll just rest in me, I'll take you places. And I remember saying, if you will take this mess, interesting word, my life's a mess, but if you'll take it, it's all yours. And since then, my life has been a series of mess-driven spiritual upgrades. Just want to say that one one more time. My life since has been a series of mess-driven spiritual upgrades. So write this in the blanks. We bring all this toward a close here. Paul saw his life as something to be stewarded. Paul saw his life as something to be stewarded. If you've been on an airplane flight recently, you know there's flight attendants that help you get through that thing. They used to be called stewards and stewardesses. You know why? Because it wasn't their peanuts. It was not their peanuts. It wasn't their drinks. They stewarded the things that they brought out and handed to you. They didn't belong to them. And Paul knew that his life didn't belong to him. If Jesus started it and Jesus is going to finish it, if my mess is going to be done and Jesus' mission is going to be done, then my days are something for Jesus to use for his glory and I'm not in charge and thank God for that. Those are not my peanuts. 20 minutes more, God? No problem. I'll just sit back in my beautiful blue leather Mercury Zephyr vinyl, not leather, and I'll be okay. My mess minus Jesus' mission equals a meaningless mess. Would you write that in? That's a warning, but I hope that warning is dwarfed by the invitation. My mess plus Jesus' mission equals Jesus' masterpiece. A masterpiece. Just one more blank. We're going to leave it empty for a minute. I want to give us all an opportunity to just, in light of hearing Paul's motives and Paul's manner, just give you an opportunity to dedicate your heart to him in a fresh way. Here's my heart, God.
I used to be angry, depressed, mostly grumpy, <laughs> but now I'm finding that God is helping me look at things differently, everything. So I'm excited and uh, I'm finding my way back to God. Before, I didn't produce any fruits of the Spirit, but now through Him, I am filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. I am finding my way back to God. Go ahead and take a seat for just a moment, please. It was a year ago that we started working through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is essentially a story of the Spirit of God's work through His people. And if you remember, throughout the whole series, we've talked about how the Spirit wants to work in us, through us, and then beyond us. And that's the difference between a good church or a great church and a God church. And that's where God's taken us. And I want to invite you with two solid steps that you can to take if you want to be a part of this or just to join it in, in a special way in which way we're doing it this fall. This fall we're going to do a series called Finding Your Way Back to God. And it's a fantastic experience. It's a, um, it's a, it's a work through the, the story of the prodigal son. Jesus tells a story about a son who messes his life up and shows the heart of the father that goes after the son. And uh, so that's coming. We want to encourage you to be a part of that. We want to encourage you to grab one of these books. Now, I'll just tell you right up front, this book is not for somebody who is already bearing fruit with Christ at all. I mean, if you're in a growing relationship with Jesus, you don't need it, but maybe a friend does. Because there's an invitation toward life in Jesus here that's profound. It's the heart of the Father 
talking to anybody that's in a mess, saying, here's how to find your way home. So if you have a friend that's looking to get out of a mess and find some solution, I don't know of a more winsome way to introduce the story than this. These cost us about a buck fifty. We're asking for about a buck to help alleviate the cost. If you can do it, great. If not, just take the book, right, and hand it to a friend. They're out in the Connection Center, which is that place no one is courageous enough to go into yet. It's a hole in the wall that it's not supposed to be there. It is. That's for you to go into. March straight in there and grab one, two, three, however many of these you need. If church for you is more of a religion and rules and you are dry and empty and you're in the mess and can't see your way out and need to hear the heart of the Father inviting you into something different, then it's for you and then it's for a friend. We want to see a thousand new unchurched families come and join us and fill up that room that's going to be coming this way this fall. This is a beautiful tool to get them there. Another thing that you can do to join is do just like Brad or Danica. Just grab your phone the instructions are right there in your bulletin that you got when you came in. I used to be blank, but now I'm finding that with Jesus, this is life. And as you can see in the directions there, just hashtag it, finding your way back to God, whatever it is there, hashtag it, put it on your social media. We'll be able to grab it from there. We're going to collect those and share them as part of the invitation to invite our community to come and be a part of this with us in the fall. Make sense? So please grab both of those opportunities and join us. Here's the big idea for today. Big idea for the whole book of Acts. Don't waste your mess. God doesn't want to waste it. You don't want to waste it. Steward that mess well and let God use it. Will you join me in reading the last verse here out loud as a benediction to one another? Let's do it. Let's stand to our feet and let's read this together. What an invitation. You ready? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the mess, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you need to talk to someone today about your mess, I've got good friends that I trust that will be down here. They would love to pray with you. God bless you, Westside. See you next time.